Sunday Sermons of St. Alphonse to the Guri, Sermon 28 for Pentecost Sunday, on conformity to the will of God. As the Father hath given me commandment, so do I. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus Christ was given to us by God as a Savior, and as a Master. Hence he came on earth principally to teach us, not only by his words, but also by his example, how we are to love God, our supreme good. Hence, as we read in this day's Gospel, he said to his disciples, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father hath given me commandment, so do I. To show the world the love I bear to the Father, I will execute all his commands. In another place he said, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Devout souls, if you love God and desire to become saints, you must seek his will and wish what he wishes. St. Paul tells us that the divine love is poured into our souls by means of the Holy Ghost. The charity of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Ghost, who is given to us. If then we wish for the gift of divine love, we must constantly beseech the Holy Ghost to make us know and to do the will of God. Let us continually implore his light to know and his strength to fulfill the divine will. Many wish to love God, but they at the same time wish to follow their own and not his will. Hence I shall show today in the first point that our sanctification consists entirely in conformity to the will of God and in the second I shall show how and in what we should in practice conform ourselves to the divine will. First point. Our sanctification consists entirely in conformity to the will of God. It is certain that our salvation consists in loving God. A soul that does not love God is not living but dead. He that loveth not abideth in death. The perfection of love consists in conforming our will to the will of God, in life in his good will. Have charity, which is the bond of perfection. According to a wise man, the principal effect of love is to unite the wills of lovers so that they may have but one heart and one will. Hence all our works, communions, prayers, penances, and alms, please God in proportion to their conformity to the divine will. And if they be contrary to the will of God, they are no longer acts of virtue, but defects deserving chastisement. Whilst preaching one day, Jesus Christ was told that his mother and brethren were waiting for him. In answer he said, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father that is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. By these words he gave us to understand that he acknowledged as friends and relatives those only who fulfill the will of his Father. The saints in heaven love God perfectly. In what, I ask, does the perfection of their love consist? It consists in an entire conformity to the divine will. Hence, Jesus Christ has taught us to pray for the grace to do the will of God on earth as the saints do it in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hence, St. Teresa says that they who practice prayer should seek in all things to conform their will to the will of God. In this, she adds, consists the highest perfection. He that practices it in the most perfect manner shall receive from God the greatest gifts and shall make them the greatest progress in an interior life. The accomplishment of the divine will has been the sole end of the saints in the practice of all virtues. Blessed Henry Susan used to say, I would rather be the vilest man on earth with the will of God than a seraph with my own will. A perfect act of conformity is sufficient to make a person a saint. Behold, Jesus Christ appeared to St. Paul while he was persecuting the church and converted him. What did the saint do? He did nothing more than to offer to God his will that he might be disposed of as he pleased. Lord, he exclaimed, What wilt thou have me to do? And instantly, the Lord declared to Ananias that Saul was a vessel of election and the apostle of the Gentiles. 
This man is a vessel of election to carry my name before the Gentiles. He that gives his will to God and gives him all that he has. He that mortifies himself by fasts and penitential austerities or that gives alms to the poor for God's sake gives to God a part of himself and of his goods. But he that gives his will to God gives him all and can say, Lord, having given thee my will, I have nothing more to give thee. I have given thee all. It is our heart that is our will that God asks of us. My son, give me thy heart. Since then, says the holy abbot Nihilus, our will is so acceptable to God, we ought in our prayers to ask of him the grace, not that we may do what he will, but that what we may do, all that he wishes us to do. Everyone knows this truth, that our sanctification consists in doing the will of God. But there is some difficulty in reducing it to practice. Let us then come to the second point, in which I will have to say many things of great practical utility. How and in what we ought to practice conformity to the will of God. That we may feel a facility of doing on all occasions the divine will, we must beforehand offer ourselves continually to embrace in peace whatever God ordains or wills. Such was the practice of Holy David. My heart, he used to say, is ready. O God, my heart is ready. And he continually besought the Lord to teach him to do his divine will. Teach me to do thy will. He thus deserved to be called called a man according to God's own heart. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man I am according to my own heart, who shall always do my will. And why? Because the holy king was always ready to do whatever God wished him to do. St. Teresa offered herself to God fifty times in the day, that he might dispose of her as he pleased, and declared her readiness to embrace either prosperity or adversity. The perfection of our oblation consists in offering ourselves to God without reserve. All are prepared to unite themselves to the divine will and prosperity. But perfection consists in conforming to it even in adversity. To thank God in all things that are agreeable to us is acceptable to him, but to accept with cheerfulness what is repugnant to our inclinations is still more pleasing to him. Father Amavila used to say that a single blessed be God in adversity is better than 6,000 thanksgivings in prosperity. We should conform to the divine will, not only in misfortunes which come directly from God, such as sickness, loss of property, privation of friends and relatives, but also in crosses which come to us from men, but indirectly from God, such as acts of injustice, defamations, calumnies, injuries, and all other sorts of persecutions. But you may ask, does God will that others commit sin by injuring us in our property or in our reputation? No, God does not will their sin. But he wishes us to bear with such a loss and with such a humiliation. And he wishes us to conform on all such occasions to his divine will. Good things and evil are from God. All blessings such as riches and honors and all misfortunes such as sickness and persecutions come from God. But mark that the scripture calls them evils only because we, through a want of conformity to the will of God, regard them as evils and misfortunes. But in reality, if we accepted them from the hands of God with Christian resignation, they should be blessings and not evils. The jewels which give the greatest splendor to the crown of the saints in heaven are the tribulations which they bore with patience as coming from the hands of the Lord. On hearing that the Sabaeans had taken away all his oxen and asses, holy Job said, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. He did not say that the Lord gave and that the Sabaeans had taken away, but that the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. And therefore he blessed the Lord, believing that all had it happened through the divine will. As it hath pleased the Lord, so it is done. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Being tormented with iron hooks and burning torches, the holy martyrs, Epictetus and Atoni, said, Lord, thy will be done in us. And their last words were, Be blessed, O eternal God, for having given us the grace to accomplish thy will. Whatsoever shall befall the just man, it shall not make him sad. A soul that loves God is not disturbed by any misfortune that may happen to her. Caesarius relates that a certain monk who did not perform greater austerities than his companions wrought many miracles. Being astonished at this, the abbot asked him one day what were the works of piety which he practiced. He answered that he was more imperfect than the other monks, but that his sole concern was to conform himself to the the divine will. Were you displeased, said the abbot, with the person who injured us so grievously a few days ago? No, father, replied the monk. I, on the contrary, thank God for it, because I know that he does or permits all things for our good. From this answer, the abbot perceived the sanctity of the good religious. We should act in a similar manner under all of the crosses that come upon us. Let us always say, Yea, Father, for so hath it seemed good in thy sight. Lord, this is pleasing to thee. Let it be done. He that acts in this manner enjoys that peace which the angels announce at the birth of Jesus Christ to men of good will. That is, to those whose wills are united to the will of God. These, as the Apostle says, enjoy that peace which exceeds all sensual delights. The peace of God which surpasseth all understanding. A great and solid peace which is not liable to change. A holy man continueth in wisdom like the sun, but a fool is changing like the moon. Fools, that is, sinners, are changed like the moon, which increases today and grows less on tomorrow. Today they are seen to laugh through folly, and tomorrow to weep through despair. Today they are humble and meek, tomorrow proud and furious. In a word, sinners change with prosperity and adversity. But the just are like the sun, always the same, always serene in whatever happens to them. In the inferior part of the soul, they cannot but feel some pain at the misfortunes which befall them. But as long as the will remains united to the will of God, nothing can deprive them of that spiritual joy which is not subject to the vicissitudes of this life. Your joy no man shall take from you. He that reposes in the divine will is like a man placed above the clouds. He sees the lightning and hears the claps of thunder and the raging of the tempest below, but he is not injured or disturbed by them. How can he ever be disturbed when whatever he desires always happens? He that desires only what pleases God always obtains whatsoever he wishes, because all that happens to him happen through the will of God. Salvian says that Christians who are resigned, if they be in a low condition of life, wish to be in that state. If they are poor, they desire poverty, because they wish whatever God wills. And therefore, they are always content. If cold or heat, or rain or wind come on, He that is united to the will of God says, I wish for this cold, this heat, this rain, and this wind, because God wills them. If loss of property, persecution, sickness, or even death come upon him, he says, I wish for this loss, this persecution, this sickness. I wish even for death when it comes, because God wills it. And how can a person who seeks to please God, enjoy greater happiness than that which arises from cheerfully embracing the cross which God sends him. And from the conviction that in embracing it, he pleases God in the highest degree. So great was the joy which St. Mary Magdalene de Padze used to feel at the bare mention of the will of God that she would fall into an ecstasy. But how great is the folly of those who resist the divine will And instead of receiving tribulations with patience, get into a rage and accuse God of treating them with injustice and cruelty. Perhaps they expect that in consequence of their opposition, what God wills shall not happen. Who resisteth his will? Miserable men! 
instead of lightening the cross which God sends them, they make it more heavy and painful. Who hath resisted them and have peace? Let us be resigned to the divine will, and we shall thus render our crosses light, and shall gain great treasures of merits for eternal life. In sending us tribulations, God intends to make us saints. This is the will of God, your sanctification. He sends us crosses not because he wishes evil to us, but because he desires our welfare, because he knows that they are conducive to our salvation. All things work together unto good. Even the chastisements which come from the Lord are not for our destruction, but for our good, and for the correction of our faults. Let us believe that these scourges of the Lord have happened for our amendment, and not for our destruction. God loves us so tenderly that he not only desires, but is solicitous about our welfare. The Lord says, David, is careful for me. Let us then always throw ourselves into the hands of God, who so ardently desires and so anxiously watches over our eternal salvation. Casting all your care upon him, for he hath care of you. He who during life cast himself into the hands of God shall lead a happy life and shall die a holy death. He who dies resigned to the divine will dies a saint. But they who shall not have been united to the divine will during life shall not conform to it at death and shall not be saved. The accomplishment of the divine will should be the sole object of all of our thoughts during the remainder of our days. To this end, we should direct all of our devotions, our meditations, communions, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, and all of our prayers. We should constantly beg of God to teach and help us to do His will. Teach me to do Thy will. Let us at the same time offer ourselves to accept without reserve whatever He ordains, saying with the Apostle, Lord, What wilt thou have me to do? Lord, tell me what thou dost wish me to do. I desire to do thy will. And in all things, whether they be pleasing or painful, let us always have in our mouths that petition of the Paternoster, Thy will be done, fiat voluntas tua. Let us frequently repeat it in the day with all of the affections of our hearts. Happy if we live and die, saying, Thy will be done, thy will be done, Fiat voluntas tua. Fiat voluntas tua. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Alphonsus to the Gary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.